Hey guys, Perry here, and I am back with another exclusive Collider video interview. This is a special one. I know I say that a lot, but we have a super talented director here right now who has made a movie that I hope you've seen. If you haven't seen it, get on it. We're going to talk about it right now, and you're going to want to check it out. Ted Melfi, thank you so much thank for coming you. to the studio today. Huge congratulations on Hidden Figures. Thanks thanks for having me. It's, it's kind of nuts, right? Yeah, yeah, I really, it is kind of nuts. I saw it the first time, and... I, I was blown away. Mm. I loved the movie and I expected it to get a very positive reception, but like awards buzz and the box office right now. I mean, did you ever imagine that that movie would be the one to top Rogue One? N no, I mean, it's it's a movie about three female mathematicians, black female. It's like unheard of. Like it's it's like a, they become superheroes. That's I don't know. They're, they tackled Rogue One and then the next week they tackled... Uh, Silence and and two other films and and this week we're doing great again. So still going strong. Yeah. I I got high hopes for it this weekend too. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about just the start of all of this for you? Because I know I I believe I read in the notes that you went after this project. So what do you have to do to kind of win the chance to direct something like Hidden Figures? Uh, well, you know, I, I at the time I was up for Spider Man. Yeah. I completely forgot yeah, about I, that. I, yeah. It was, oh, and it, you, did you choose between the yeah, two? All yeah, yeah. Right. And, and, and I was up for Spider-Man, and Spider-Man was going to give us, Marvel was going to give us an answer on Monday, hmm. right? And it had been a four-month process with them. And on Friday, my agents called me and said, We've got, we know you're, you're going to hear about Spider-Man on Monday, but you have to hear the story. And so they, they tell me the story. They said, in 1962, there was a team of women that were integral putting a man into space. And those women were black women. And I went, shut up. I went, shut up. Really? I said, you have to send it to me. So I read it on sa uh, that weekend. I read it on Saturday. On, on Monday, I called and said, I can't do Spider-Man. So I withdrew from Spider-Man. And I said, I want to do this. And I just, I just uh, met with the producer and told her all the reasons why I should do it. And she said yes. And, and there we are. Now, I imagine you're super happy you made that decision. Back then, you know, you have something like Spider-Man. St. Vincent was your uh, feature directorial debut, right? My second film. Second, yeah. second film. So at that point, I imagine, you know, you want something that's going to, you know, make your name a household name, and you turn down Spider-Man. So was there anyone in your life, an agent or a manager, who said to you, like, are you crazy? No. Uh, my, strangely enough, my agents said this was the one to do. I don't know why. I mean, they, they said you're going to not make any money, <laughs> it's good, but you'll be fulfilled and you'll make something that matters. So, um, no, my, my wife was the same way, Kim, Kimberly Quinn. She produced the film with me, and uh, I don't know. Not one person said you should do Spider-Man. You got some smart people in your life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the reason is them. I grew up, I'm, I'm a huge Spider-Man fan. Of all the comics in the world, Spider-Man is my favorite. I mean, I grew up in Brooklyn. I mean, Spider-Man is my, my jam, right? But, but uh I, I don't, I've seen it, you know, so like I, I, I see it and I love it and I, and I can't wait to see this new iteration of it, but this was some, a chance to do something more important for me. Well, don't worry, because superhero movies are not going anywhere anytime <laughs> soon, and after the success of this, I wouldn't be surprised if you got another golden opportunity like that. Yeah, well, I, the way I look at it is if you look at that picture, they, they, they feel like three superheroes to me. They I mean, really do. They're, they're, like the most fun superheroes ever. Yeah. <laughs> Smartest and fun. I mean... You know, we're making, they're making Legos of them. They're talking really? about... Really? Yeah, they're talking about action figures of them. Huh. Yeah. Th these, these three women are really inspiring a whole new generation of, of kids and teens and tweens and... Oh, really. My. Whole schools are buying out theaters. The, the idea of owning a Hidden Figures Lego set really excites me. <laughs> yes, it did. It'd be fun. So can you tell me now about your journey as a director? Because, you, again, you're just talking about potentially doing Spider-Man as your third film. What was it about Hidden Figures having to hit at this point in your career? Is there anything you learned from making your past films that you took to this one? Uh, I've been I've been working for like you know twenty years in this business, and I've made nine movies. <clears throat> I produced nine movies. Mm -hmm. um, I've only directed three. Uh, what I've learned is that is that you never know what's going to happen to something, or, or what what's going to be the right timing for something, or what's going to make what's going to strike a chord with people. All you all I've ever learned, all I ever carry, carry forward is what matters to me at that moment is something to do. Right, and if it matters to me, the odds are it matters to others. So I, I this movie so inspired me, and so I, 
I was so blown away that, that we didn't know these women and, and, and I have two daughters and they want to be mathematicians and scientists. And, and I just, you know, it was just a, a hard, it was a hard decision, really. How much of the mathematics do you really have to understand? Because I look at something like that on screen and, you know, it's, a, it's, it's all over the chalkboard. And I imagine you have some sort of expert making sure everything is yes, accurate. Yes. But, like, do you as a director need to understand what those calculations mean? And does Taraji as well? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did a I did a severe boot camp on the math with with two math uh, with with two NASA historians, Dr. Bill Barry and Bert Ulrich, and a and a math professor at Morehouse College, Dr. Rudy Horn, and I did an immersive, weeks long I mean four or five weeks long immersion into the math, <clears throat> into learning the trajectories and the calculations and what it took to put a, a man into space and what it took to put a man in suborbit and the difference between suborbit and orbital flight and then parabolic orbit and uh, you, it, you, you had to do it because if I didn't understand it, I thought, how can I, uh, it's a fraud. If I don't understand it, I'm not gonna be able to explain it to the audience and I'm not gonna be able to explain it to the actors. Taraji did the same thing and she didn't like math at all. And she went home every night, we got her a chalkboard for her room and she worked on that math day in and day out and all the math she does on that board is 100% accurate. How about the truth to all of this? Because whenever we get a movie where it's based on a true story, inspired by a true story, everyone's, everyone's always wondering, well, how much of is it really? Is this really true? Is there a composite character somewhere? So can you kind of break down what is completely factually accurate and what you had to do just to simply make an, an entertaining, <coughs> moving movie? Uh, it, it's shockingly accurate. I mean, the, the, well, the last third... The, the last act of the movie is um, is the the Mercury missions. So it's it's Alan Shepard's maiden mm -hmm. voyage. It's Gus Grissom and it's John Glenn. You can't lie on that. And that stuff is like straight up. So that's NASA archives and NASA historians uh, input. And that's straight out of transcripts from NASA. It's 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 perfect spot on. Everything that happens to the women in the movie, Katherine Johnson's trajectory is exactly as it was. Katherine Johnson. First woman to get invited to the space task group. First woman to get invited into a Pentagon briefing room. First woman to have her name on a report at NASA. The only person that John Glenn trusted to run his, his numbers. John Glenn's direct quote in the movie, get the girl to run the numbers. If she says they're good, I'm good to go. It's talking about Katherine Johnson, and it's a direct quote. It's just all these things are real, <laughs> are true. Uh, Mary Jackson's character, Mary... Mary um, had the same degree as all of her white counterparts, white male counterparts at NASA, yet they became engineers and she could only be a mathematician. So she petitioned the court, she changed the system, she became NASA's first African-American engineer. Dorothy Vaughn, same thing, became the first African-American supervisor at NASA. All those things are true. The movie's pretty much spot on, except, you know, some dramatic stuff as you go along. Mm -hmm. And is there anything you learned about their experience that you wish that you could have included, but you couldn't just because, you know, a movie is only so long? Uh, I wish I could have spent more time with their home lives. You know, I mean, Dorothy Vaughn's home life was incredible. She was a mother of four, and her husband had a farm in Farmville, Virginia, and she said, I'm good. I want to get a better job. And I've got a job offer at NASA. And he said, well, we, we live in Farmville. She said, not anymore. And she moved her kids without her husband <laughs> to, to uh, NASA, to Hampton, Virginia, and was a single mom with four kids and saw her husband on the weekends. So there's all those little details that you can't do them all, but they, they tell you so much about who they were. Is that kind of information in the uh, the book it's based it's on? It's in the book. Okay, good. And it the book, it the books serves are, as a, a good companion piece. This is a great way to start, and then both of them can work hand in hand. Yeah, the book has gone crazy, too. It's, a, it's the number one New York Times bestseller. And the young adult version, the young reader version, is the number one. Oh, wow. And that, that version is fantastic for kids. It's, it's so good that you have all of these different options to explore the story, and it seems like it's only growing with, with these toy lines you're detailing now. <laughs> it's, 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 it's nuts. Last week in L.A., we, showed, we screened the movie for free for 10,000 LAUSDA, LAUSDA oh, wow. kids, and uh, it was packed. It was hmm. packed, and they left there on fire. Oh, that's so awesome. It's fantastic. And now I got to ask a little bit about the casting. I mean, I'm very familiar with uh, Taraji and Octavia, but... When Janelle Monet got this role, and this is her first feature film role, folks were a little surprised. She is just 
freaking radiant in this movie. So can you tell a little, tell me a little bit about the decision to cast her and then just working with her as an, a first-time actress? Yeah. Uh, once we got Taraji and Octavia in the movie, the studio said, you are free to play, hmm. right, with the role of Mary Jackson. And we wanted to... Mary Jackson's character was such a fire plug, right? She was, she was the, the fighter of the three. Uh, we auditioned everyone around. Janelle walks into our room in Atlanta. I had no idea who Janelle Monet was. I mean, I knew her music, but I didn't, know, I didn't really know anything about her. She walked in and, and did that courtroom scene, mm -hmm. and we, I was shocked. I was blown away. I said, I don't know what just happened, but that's the spirit of Mary Jackson. So uh, it, was, it was a brainless decision because she just, she, she's just so unique and fresh, and she's a fighter, and, and she's an activist and, mm -hmm. in her own life. Uh, working with her uh, was a joy because she's, as a singer, she's able to pick up on cadence really easy. So if there's a line that needs to be said a certain way, she can just just get it. And so she was she was remarkable. Worked so hard. I mean, it came to set on fire every day. It, they that picture up there describes the movie to me. They were like that every day. Keeping them contained was the hardest part of directing the movie. That's the feeling I get from the movie because that that is what's so <laughs> special about it. And and actually, one of my favorite things about the movie overall, and I said this in my review, is that. It never, it never undermines or kind of lessens the stakes of what they're struggling with whatsoever, but there is just such like an infectious, high energy, like positive vibe to it. Was that always the tone that you knew you were going to get to in the end, or is that something that came through in the production process, in the edit? Uh, I, I think it's just the way, the way um, I, I, I see life. I see life as like, you can either look at life two ways. You can either complain about life or you can be inspired by life. And, and we choose to laugh every day. I mean, we laughed on set every day. Uh, and the reason is, you know, life was already hard, right? As my mom would say, you don't got to prepare for tears. That comes, right? Someone dies, this, things happen. But you have to make time for laughter. So we tried to laugh and to enjoy it. And, and you know, the segregation in the 1960s, in that time, that's what it was. It was what it was. People didn't know the difference between segregation and non-segregation and desegregation because it was, didn't exist. So when you grow up in that environment, you accepted it. You just, that's the way it was. So they had joy. They lived their lives joyfully, even in the midst of that, that nightmare part of history in American culture. And I have no good transition for this, but I want to hit these two points before we have to wrap this up. The song Runnin'. First of all, I love that song. I actually did just run a race recently, and it was on my playlist because just to be able to picture what happens in the movie, and that song is just so damn catchy. But I know the lyrics in the song is very much connected to what is happening in that moment. Yeah. So is that a situation where the song was specifically written for the shoot, or is it something where it kind of came up after and Pharrell made it for what he had seen and what you had edited? No, he wrote that song after reading the script. So the song was written specifically for that scene. We shot that scene listening to that song because he read the script and then two weeks later he wrote the song and sent it to us. And we hadn't started shooting yet. And we, Taraji listened to that song while she was running. It was playing in the background while we were shooting. Uh, what I love about Pharrell is, is, is harkens back to what you just said a minute ago. The movie's uplifting and inspiring and positive, right? The song, the beat, is uplifting and inspiring and positive. However, the lyrics are spot on. Yep. Right? To, to what's going on in the times, to the racism, to the sexism. They put the lyrics in the press notes, and I caught myself reading and rereading, and it makes the song mean even more than it already did. Yeah, and you don't, and so you're able to get the message of the song without being hit on the head with the, you know, normally you'd have that scene in traditional filmmaking or whatever, you, you'd put something dire. Mm -hmm. It's not good that she's running a quarter mile to the bathroom. It's sad, right? But you put an upbeat tone there with lyrics that tell you the truth, and it's just, this, it, it's remarkable to me. My other burning question, film versus digital. Can you tell me a little bit about coming to that decision? Uh, look, I, I, I shoot, I've shot hundreds of commercials. All I ever shoot is the Alexa or the Red. I mean, you know, everything is digital. However, um, I come from, um, all my feature work is on film. And I just think film's better. I mean, I, I mean, not to, 
not to put digital down. I love it. I use it all the time. But I think film is better. I think film is a better medium. I think film captures captures a feeling and a chemical process and, and the chemical process that can never be can never and will never be duplicated. And it's a period piece. So for me, it was a period piece. It had to be on film. It had to look like the 1960s. I I definitely see that in there. Good choice. And just before we have to wrap up, because now everyone is going to want to know the dreaded end of the interview question. (laughs) What's coming next for you? What's coming next for me? I'm writing a movie for Fox right now called Fruit Loops. And it's the story of the last uh, state-owned mental institution in upstate New York. Ooh. What yeah. what genre would that fall in? It, it's kind of it, it, it reminds me of Cuckoo's Nest Cross with Dog Day Afternoon. Hmm. I'm intrigued. Yes, I like that answer. <laughs> yes. I'm curious. Good luck with that. Good luck with this in the coming weeks. I mean, big box office, and I have a feeling you know award season. We'll we'll be hearing the name Hidden Figures quite a bit over the next few weeks. So. Thank you so much for being here. It really was such a pleasure to get to talk about one of my favorite movies. This thing is just a joy and a pleasure. So thank you again. Thank thank you for having me. And you guys, if I didn't say it enough at the beginning, please go check out Hidden Figures. It's in theaters right now. Check it out, and we will see you soon for another Collider Videos interview. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.